All right. Hello. Welcome back. It is 6.3. Um, I realized the header on these notes is wrong. So first thing we're going to do is change that uh, from discrete and continuous random variables. We're going to change that to binomial and geometric random variables. We're talking about two specific types of random variables with specific distributions that we're going to talk about. Um, up until now, we've only had one distribution we've dealt with, the normal distribution. Now we're going to have a, a couple other ones, the binomial distribution, which actually kind of leads to the normal distribution, and the geometric, which some of you from calculus might see and just think, ooh, that's a, that looks like a geometric series. Some a geometric series? That, that could be a good time. Uh, so first thing we need to do is talk about what, what the heck is a binomial setting. A uh, binomial setting, this is, these are the conditions that lead to a binomial random variable. Um, I'll just tell you, general, the first thing I think of when I think of binomial is, um, you know, k successes out of n trials. Uh, and the key phrase in there is, you know, something's going to happen this many times out of that many times. Sorry, I'm going to sneeze. I had to pause it. Didn't sneeze. All right, so uh, this many out of that many. That, that's what I'm thinking when a binomial. Uh, so we have a few conditions here. Uh, I'm going to call these the bins conditions. It's going to be out of order. Uh, first thing is each observation falls into one of two categories success or failure. Uh, I call that the, the B condition. B there is for binary outcomes. Binary. What does binary mean? Two. Two, two named outcomes, it's success or failure, up or down, left or right, zero or one, yes or no, right? Uh, so one of two things happens. It's a, it's a tree diagram with two branches. Uh, the procedure is a fixed number of trials. We call that N. Uh, so that's the N. The observations are independent. Results does not affect one another. The probabilities are the same, right? B, N, I, and the probability of success is constant. Uh, there it spells BNIS. Usually I write that as uh, the BINS conditions. Binary outcomes, independent trials, number of trials is fixed, and probability of success is constant. Where have you seen this before? If you look at uh, 6.1, problem number one, it was about what happens if you flip a coin four times. What are the outcomes? And if you sat there and you, you made like a heads, and it tails, and then you did it again, 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 yeah, right. And then you did it one more time. Bam, 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 bam. And you said, man, this is tedious. And you found there's like 16 outcomes. You said, man, that's a, that's, that's, that's a lot of work. We're gonna find how, it is, uh, how we can do uh, that kind of thing a lot easier. Uh, if we know that it's a binary, excuse me, a binomial, uh, random variable, um, then we can we can apply the probability formulas we know down below, which kind of look gnarly, but we're actually going to use our calculator for most of the time because memorizing that formula isn't all that helpful. I mean, it's useful. Uh, AP example 2004, number three, at an archaeological site that was an ancient swamp. Great. Uh, bones from 20 brontosaur, brontosaur skeletons have been unearthed. That sounds fun. They don't show any sign of disease or malformation. That doesn't seem particularly relevant to us solving a statistics problem. It's thought that the animals wandered into a deep area swamp and became trapped in the swamp bottom. The 20 left femur bones were located, and four of them are to be randomly sampled without replacement for DNA testing to determine gender. Let X be the number out of four selected left femurs that are from males. Based on how the bones were sampled, a, explain why it's not binomial. Well, let's, let's check the bins conditions. Are there binary outcomes? Yes, I, I, there are. It's either yes or no. Uh, is, it a, is it a male femur bone or not? All right, so it's got binary outcomes. Uh, independence of trials. Is one draw independent from another? No. Why? Without replacement.
as a consequence, which other condition fails? Number of trials is good. Uh, success is not constant. It changes with each draw. If we're not putting them back in, the probabilities are changing every time. Too much, right? We need the probability to be the same. We need to be the coin flip probability to be the same every time. We need to be the probability of spinning the wheel and getting the thing to be the same every time. We don't have that here. Uh, so down below, we have binomial random variable x. Uh, and we say, um, you know, if x uh, has binomial setting with uh, n trials and p success equals p, then we can write it this way. We write x is distributed binomially with parameters n and p. Just like we wrote for the normal distribution before, something distributed n mu sigma. Now we're going to write things binomial looking like that. So that's the notation we're going to use for a binomial random variable. That says bin, right? B-I-N, bin for binomial. Uh, and so we've got some notation here. So buckle in for the notation time. Uh, notation for binomial distributions. N is the number of trials. Okay. That, that seems reasonable. N number of trials. K is the number of successes. I don't know. We suck. Um, P is the probability of success. And 1 minus P uh, is probably then a failure. Why? Those are complementary events, right? Everything, every outcome is going to be success or failure. Okay, and you get this formula down below. What the heck does it? I think that binomial is really nice for when a really complicated tree diagram doesn't sound like a lot of fun. So let's break this formula down. What does this say? The probability, this says the probability of K successes. One, two, three, however many successes up to N understand that the number of success is x, x is going to be an element of uh, what? Uh, well, it's going to be an element of the whole numbers, right? 0 up to n, and x has got to be, uh, x is between there, 0 and n, lowercase n. Uh, you might not care about that all that much. You should, though. You can't have more than n successes. You can't have fewer than 0. I'm sorry if that got messed up. x is between 0 and n. And I'm not sure that looks all that much better. Uh, what does this formula say? OK, the probability of getting k successes. This thing right here, this is the binomial coefficient. This is that thing off of Pascal's triangle. You know, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. What does this thing do? This thing tells us kind of how many branches have K successes on it. I'm going to write that down for you. How many branches have K successes? How many ways are there to have K successes, right? If, there's, if you're flipping a coin four times, how many ways is there to get one heads? Are you the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one? There's four ways. Oh, oh, look at that. So it turns out that this is like zero, zero up here. This is like, uh, what is that? It's like four choose one. That's like, how many ways can I have one success out of four trials? Great. So that first term that says how many branches have K successes, this branch right here, this is the probability of K successes. And this right here is the probability of N minus K failures. It's like how many ways can we arrange this many successes and this many failures? Um, that's the probability of the K successes. That's the probability of everything else being a failure, right? Because either it's a success or a failure. Uh, and then we have here formulas for the mean and standard, devi standard deviation. The mean is how many times are we going to do it times the probability it works. I think that's pretty intuitive. Uh, the standard deviation, not intuitive. It's on your formula sheet. What, what does all this look like? 
like, what, what, what could I visualize successes and failures happening in succession like this? Well, you might visualize it as, uh, as, as Plinko, right? Because everything is either a success or a failure. We have a fixed probability. Uh, what's success? I don't know. To the right. What's failure? To the left. I don't know. And then you sit and you do this, and I'm going to mute it so I don't have to listen to this. And in the background, as, as this goes on, we're going to expect it to approach this ideal distribution, this blue distribution, where the most common thing to happen is in the middle. Why? Well, it's equally prob probable. Notice probability is point five here, it's equally probable that it goes left or right. So on average, it's going to go left as many times as it go right. And if it's got six options, it's going to go left three times, right three times. And we end up with this distribution. This is what a binomial distribution looks like. Um, centered at NP. What is NP here? Six times 0.5 is three. Half of six is three. Uh, you, you probably could have intuited that. Uh, and so we can use this distribution uh, to, to talk about these things. It's very exciting. So this is a visualization. It's a tree diagram, left, right, left, right, where the probabilities are the same on each branching. Be sure that we'll come back to uh, the, the FET Plinko uh, a, a lot. I like that. Um, I like that quite a bit. So get your calculators out. We are going to look at our calculators. Oh, come on, cameras. We're going to look at our calculators. We're going to use them to solve these probabilities. Uh, you have here two things. You have something called the binomial PDF, and you have the binomial CDF, and you've got a very nice table here. You should be referencing this table. Don't ask me how to put this in your calculator. Look at this first. The idea is that the PDF does exactly equal to sorts of things, and the CDF does less than and equal to sorts of things. So, you know, the biggest thing is that you need to be careful with your dang inequalities. Uh, understand, uh, if you're asked to say probability x is greater than 7 or something, well, think about what numbers you're talking about. You're talking about 8, 9, 10, dot, dot, dot. Well, you're not talking about seven. To find the probability x greater than or equal to seven, you're gonna to have to do something like one minus probability that x is less than or equal to seven. That would be zero, one, two, dot, 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 up to seven. Uh, you're gonna find that you're often gonna to wanna to write out the, um, the possibilities, write out the values you're talking about so you don't mess up the inequalities. Um, this is where you're gonna mess up. You got a really nice table here. Uh, the big idea is the PDF tells you exactly equal to, the CDF tells you less than equal to, and if you want to figure anything else out from those, you got to play with the inequalities uh, intelligently. So uh, in roulette, great. 18 to 38 spaces in the wheel are black. Cool. 18 to 38. Suppose you observe the next 10 spins of the roulette wheel. Okay. Well, let's let X let the number of uh, spins on black. And we can say how X is distributed. Well, look at this. It's black or it's not. We're going to spin it 10 times. Let's look at our binomial settings. Uh, it's black or it's not. We're going to spin it 10 times. The wheel don't remember. Those are independent spins. And the probability of success is 18 out of 38 every time. This is a binomial setting. X is distributed binomially with uh, N trials. So we're going to spin it 10 times. Probability of success is. 18 out of 38, and I'm going to label that NP. Uh, and out to the side, you might just remind yourself how we might have checked the bins conditions there. All right, what's the probability that exactly four of the spins land on black? Exactly four. We're looking here for the probability that X is equal to four. Uh, visually, what are we talking about here? Visually, we're talking about this. Nine, 10, uh, probability of success. What is 18 out of 38? Oh, as a decimal, come on, calculator, 18 out of 38. That's 0.47. Uh, you know, probability is exactly four. We're talking about how many land in this column, the four column right here. How many is it going to be? I don't know run this probability long enough, run the simulation long enough, we're going to have a guess. This is a simulation, right? Could be used to determine the true probability. 
All right, so chugging along, finding the probability x is exactly equal to four. We could plug it into that formula, but I'm gonna suggest we don't. Once we've said this, and you need to say this stuff on every problem involving a random variable. You need to define what the variable is, how is it distributed? This kind of thing, that's crucial because you can't just skip to calculator stuff. You don't know that, you need to know that. Uh, so we could you know, plug in the formula. We could write this as 10 choose four, uh, 18 out of 38 to the fourth and uh, 20 out of 38 to the sixth. That looks terrible though. I don't wanna do that over and over. That's, you don't wanna do that. You wanna let, well, you wanna let the calculator do this work for you. It can with the binomial PDF function. You plug four things into that, N, P, and K. So the 10, 18 out of 38, and four, and you label those N, P, and K. Which one of those do you wanna do? It is the bottom one. The answer is the bottom one. You get your calculator out. You go second VARS, get your distribution menu up. There you see normal CDF, flip down to the bottom and you got your binome stuff. We're choosing answer or option A here. 10 trials, probability of success is 18 out of 38. You can put a fraction right there, it does not care. X value is four. Boom, 0.2247. That is a whole lot easier than drawing out a tree diagram with 10 branches on it, counting how many of those branches have four successes on it. That's for the birds. This tells you about, um, tells you about these situations where two things can happen, constant probability of success, a uh, fixed number of trials and independent trials. Uh, part B, what's the probability that at least eight? All right, so that's probability X greater than equal to eight. Well, we need to take away, because we don't have a function that tells us about greater than equal to, uh, but we do have a function that tells us about less than equal to. So that'd be like eight, nine, 10. Which outcomes do we not care about? Everything less than eight. That would be everything seven or less, so zero, one, two, dot, 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 six, seven, right? Uh, we do that, that's gonna be one minus a different function, binome CDF, three things into that, N, P, and K, the K value here is seven, N, P, K. Uh, you do that, one minus, Second VARS gets you your distribution menu. Go to binome CDF, it's option B. Three things go into that, N, P, and K. 10, whoops, 18 out of 38. And what are we, seven decide? I put, I baked the one minus into it. Um, if you didn't bake the one minus in, you got an answer 0. 0.6, uh, you know, 0. 0.66 something, or excuse me, 0. 0.96 something. My answer though, which is the final answer is 0.038, I'm gonna round up, call it five. So you got about a 4% chance of winning at least eight spins in a row on the roulette wheel. Those are not good odds, my friend, not good odds. Uh, I wouldn't count on it. Wouldn't bet the home on it. Uh, so we can work binomial distribution problems. I'm actually going to, uh, I'm gonna pause on the next one, let y'all work through it real quick. Um, we have a key. Let's pause and take a look. Look at the key. It's sitting on the key for some reason. Uh, I'm not too worried about it uh, beyond uh, numbers four and five, really. Uh, mu of x, guys, if, if, you're, if you got a five options of how to guess something, you got 10 questions, one fifth of 10, hopefully it's pretty intuitive that you'd get two right. Uh, so on this one, I am interested in saying uh, mu of x equals np in this problem. That's 10 times one fifth you would get two right there. And sigma x uh, would be square root NP one minus P. That would be square root uh, 10, one fifth, four fifths, uh, square root of 40 over 25, square root 40, oops. And we get, uh, what do we get? 1.26, so uh, on average, 
we would guess two correctly um, in the long run. And on average, those, those number of correct guesses would be 1.2 from that mean value of two. I'm gonna keep moving. I am gonna skip around these notes because they get long. Uh, what is the 10% rule? The 10% rule uh, says that um, we can assume independence of trials if we sample less than 10% of the population. Uh, how do we write that? We write that as little n less than or equal to capital N over 10, where little n again is the sample size and big N is the population size. Um, when is it okay to use the binomial distribution when sampling without replacement? Why is this an issue? Uh, if, if N again is less than or equal to cap N over 10, um, the probability of success doesn't change. And I'm gonna put this in quotes, enough to matter. How much is enough to matter? Well, that's up to the statistician to decide when an approximation is valid. Uh, so we have something, you might've noticed it, that if in certain, under certain conditions, this normal distribution, it can, excuse me, this binomial distribution can start to look normal. And I alluded to it earlier. Um, and it turns out as, sam as n sample size increases, what happens to the shape of the binomial distribution? The binomial distribution with parameters n, p, it converges in distribution as the sample size gets really big uh, to a normal distribution with mean NP and standard deviation square root NP one minus P. The idea is that what was a binomial distribution starts to look like a normal distribution. Uh, and this is true under certain conditions. It's true if NP is at least 10 and N one minus P is at least 10. What, is, what do those represent? Those represent the expected successes and failures. Uh, we need one other thing to be true. We need the sample size to be less than 10% of the population size. And that's when we're gonna come back to all the time. We're gonna be checking these conditions all the time. Get used to checking them. They are not going away. Those are our normal approximation conditions and our independence conditions. Get used to seeing those. Write those words, normal and independence below those. What's the biggest sample size that can be performed? 10% of the population. It's like, I think this is an important idea and you really need to get it. So we have a binomial distribution. Um, we can say that it becomes normal under certain conditions. You got a homework question that's gonna do it. I'm not gonna worry about it too much. Uh, you have an example on the next page, uh, which I am going to skip um, for the sake of time. Uh, but I'm not gonna skip the next one uh, about tire manufacturers. Take a look. You've done part A before. Try part A, I'm more interested in part B, at least two out of five. Take a moment, try and set that up as a binomial thing. All right, hopefully you were able to do part A. Uh, that's, a that's a pretty straightforward norm, uh, inverse norm kind of problem. You're finding the 70th percentile, you had to go on the Z table, say, okay, 70th percentile occurs at Z score 0.52 and use your Z score formula from there. I'm not gonna talk about A. Part B, you're finding the probability Y is at least two. Um, some things that you likely, I, I would have needed you to write out for me. Some things you would have written out to the side. You would have said probably Y, uh, where's my tilde? Distributed uh, binomially with parameters uh, five and 0.3. Wanted you to write that somewhere. You're looking to find the probability Y, uh, you know, again, is at least two, and that becomes one minus the probability y is less than or equal to one. You wouldn't have written that formula. You would have written one minus binomial uh, CDF um, NPK 
point three and uh, one. And below that, you would have labeled n p k. Um, that's how you would have arrived at your answer. Hopefully, you would have done that. If you don't have the stuff in blue, add it now, um, along with. Uh, whoops, I don't want to do that. Ah, don't go away. Along with the probability statements they have written there. So uh, make sure you're good on that. So we have binomial distributions. I'm going to skip another one of these examples, 2010 number four. I'm going to skip that. Uh, and we need to move on to the geometric or else this video is going to get very long. So let's hop on to the geometric. Remember, next week, uh, there'll be a one-day video that goes back and fills in all the gaps on these FRQs because there are just a lot here. So moving on to the geometric setting, um, you're looking at it, you're saying, okay, this looks rather similar to what I had for the binomial with, with one difference, hopefully you notice. Um, we're not counting the number of uh, this many out of that many. We're really looking for how long until a success. How many times do I gotta do this thing before I win? How many times do I gotta, I gotta spin the wheel, roll the dice? Uh, how many times do I gotta do the thing before I get, get the win? Um, so we're gonna have here each uh, observation falls into one or two categories. That's the B for binomial outcomes or binary outcomes. Uh, independent trials, so we get B, I. Uh, probably the success is the same, same success, or S. But now we're not looking for how many successes out of how many trials. It's the number of trials to find the first success. Um, so we're looking for, I'm gonna call that T, BIST, or I, I often call it BITS. Uh, think about this as the waiting time distribution, uh, binary outcomes, independence of trials. Where's the trial where the first success occurs? This is the big thing here. Trial of the first success. That's what makes the geometric interesting. And so what happened before the first success? Well, it's all failures until the first success. Um, you can imagine a tree diagram, fail, 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 and then succeed. Uh, notation here is not as bad, and the probability formula you might have intuited. Uh, this is uh, first success on the nth th trial well you got to have n minus one failures and then finally a success there's only one way to arrange n minus one failures and one success you notice we don't have a binomial coefficient here well it's not binomial but two because there's only one way to have this this uh, outcome failure 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 dot 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 dot, dot success we have a, a thing that'll do this in our calculator for us. Again, the geometric PDF is for exactly equal to, and the CDF is for less than equal to. And I'm just gonna continue to write, be careful uh, with your, um, excuse me, with your inequalities. Uh, so what is this, how do we write this? Uh, if, if I'm gonna use X, uh, has a geometric setting. We say X is distributed geometrically. It only has one parameter, P. Uh, what is the mean and standard deviation? Uh, the mean is one over P. The standard deviation. Didn't used to have to worry about this. Get your formula sheets out. You know, you, you might say, okay, if I got a one-fifth probability of success, it's going to take me five trials. The standard deviation formula, not intuitive. Let's make sure we know where all these are. Found it. All right, your formula sheet, here we are. What are we talking about right now? We have binomial and geometric here in the middle. Uh, you know, number two, mean of x, one over p, standard deviation x, square root one minus p, over p. Nothing particularly intuitive about the second formula. Um, note that they're they're given to you. Those tell you about the long-term expected value, the mean, and the kind of spread around that mean in the long run, the standard deviation. So they give you the formulas. It's all right there. Uh, but in, in practice, you're going to need to use your calculator, and you're going to need to remember how to, to use your calculator.
all right, what does the geometric random variable look like? Why is it skewed, right? Because we're multiplying by smaller values over and over. Think about what this looks like. This is, well, I mean, sh should I do it? Uh, no, no, the, the video is too long. Go look up a geometric uh, uh, series. Why is it skewed, right? Because we're constantly multiplying, we're repeatedly multiplying by values uh, smaller than one. And so when you're, you know, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the, the biggest probability is on the first time, right? Because you're always multiplying by something less than one. Uh, we have here the formula for the mean and standard deviation. Uh, and we've got a stupid little monopoly example. And Yeah, be great. Uh, and the more board game monopoly, uh, one way to get out of jail is rule doubles. Okay, probably ruling doubles one six. Why is this a geometric setting? Because uh, there are binary outcomes. Because dice rolls are independent. Uh, because we're looking for the trial of the first doubles. And because the probability of doubles is one sixth, which is a constant. Um, define the geometric random variable. Uh, X is going to be the trial of first doubles. Uh, we might say X is distributed geometrically with parameter one sixth, which is our P. The expected value is one over one sixth. And it happens one out of six times. How many times are you going to expect to do it before it happens? Six, the reciprocal. Uh, find the probability that takes uh, exactly three rolls. Uh, that would be probability x equals three. What's that going to be? Two failures and then one success. Uh, that's going to be 25 out of 216. You can do that in calculator. Point eleven fifty seven, or you could have gone second vars. You could have gone to the geometric PDF. One sixth value of three, and we get hopefully that very same answer. Noticing that we could have done that with geomet PDF uh, one sixth and three p k. And we get the same answer from both of these equals equals 0.11, what is it, 57. Uh, if we wanted to do more than four rolls, that would be probability x uh, greater than four. That'd be one minus probability x less than equal to four. Talk, remember, we're talking about five, six, or seven, dot, dot, dot. We need to take away one, zero, one, two, three, or four. Uh, and a greater than equal to, that could be done with... Uh, a geomet CDF one sixth four uh, P and K. Check your answer key on that one. Uh, I'm going to come back and do a whole nother video um, next time uh, where we just talk about all these FRQs that I've kind of skipped around. You're good to start on the homework. Expect questions next week about um, about six point three stuff. See you then.